uh, to this Keith Ness Astronomy Group event. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Gordon Mackey, and tonight, uh, myself and two other members of our group will be giving short presentations celebrating 30 years of the Hubble Space Telescope, as well as our normal audience of members from astronomy clubs from across the north of Scotland. So, hello again uh, to, to all of you in uh, uh, has Sigma, uh, Aberdeen and uh, Cairngorm and North Ronalsey. Uh, it's good to see that we're, we're all managing to continue collaborating uh, with our events. Uh, but as well as uh, the normal uh, astronomy ent enthusiasts, uh, we're streaming this live via the KTS Astronomy Group Facebook uh, page. So I'm hoping that there's going to be a number of people viewing via that, and I'd like to give them a special welcome, uh, especially if this is the first time you've joined any of our events, and I hope you enjoy it. Oh. I have technical issues uh, advancing the slide. Let's see. So we're, am I right in saying we're still stuck on the, the the first slide? Ian, do you want to unmute and tell me what you're seeing at your end? Still first slide, cover slide. Uh -huh. Aha. Okay. Thanks, <laughs> We've got there. Hey, so um, barring any other technical hitches, uh, this is the schedule for this evening. Uh, after covering a few points in relation to uh, the online meeting arrangements, I'll briefly mention some space-related events that Caithness Astronomy Group have arranged over the coming month, and that's in collaboration with the organisers of the Caithness International Science Festival. Uh, so there's lots of events happening uh, during March, I'm sure you'll be interested in. Then, uh, after those uh, brief updates. We'll have four short Hubble Space Telescope related presentations from myself, Neil McLean and Ian Darby. And in these, we'll describe the telescope itself, introduce the astronomer is named after, show Hubble images of objects amateurs can track down and observe. And finally, uh, we'll briefly cover some of the science achievements the Hubble Space Telescope has enabled. To finish off, we'll show a few more stunning images obtained by Hubble before trying to answer any questions that attendees might have. Uh, so we've agreed beforehand that I'll do the easy ones and Ian and Neil have uh, promised that they'll tackle the harder ones. Is that, is that right, chaps? That was, that, was the, that was the prior agreement. Uh, so that, that brings me to the first item on the list the online meeting arrangements. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the Zoom arrangements, uh, but for those of you that have uh, joined us on Zoom from the other astronomy clubs and from Caithness Astronomy Group, can ask that you leave your microphone muted during the presentations. And if you want to avoid your face appearing anywhere on the Facebook feed, then uh, feel free to also turn off your camera. Uh, now, I'm getting my prompts from uh, John, Ian and uh, Neil, so uh, if you guys are quite happy to leave your camera on, start waving if uh, things go awry, and uh, I'm talking about things that are not showing up on the screen. If you want to ask a question, uh, feel free, free to put it in the Zoom chat or post uh, details on uh, Facebook, and we've got somebody who's monitoring those for incoming questions. We'll cover those questions at the end, uh, or if there are quick questions there, we can probably cover them as we swap over presenters. Uh, so there's a couple of options there. So upcoming events, as I uh, said uh, before we kicked off for real, uh, we've got a busy period coming up. And as part of that, uh, KTS Astronomy Group members uh, should mark in their diary 
the date for the AGM, which is Saturday, 27th of February. But I suspect most of the people who will join in us tonight will be far more interested in the Eighth Nest Science Festival events during March. I'm not going to go into uh, the event list in detail. I'll just highlight that this year, Eighth Nest Astronomy Group have contributed a mix of online presentations and live streamed observations of the night sky. Uh, so the latter component obviously is weather dependent. So if it's cloudy, we won't be doing the live streamed observations. Uh, part of the arranged content includes presentations by uh, special guest speaker, Dr. Mike Sims from the National Museums in Northern Ireland. And I'd highly recommend that you add those ones to your calendar if no other ones. Uh, we've been lucky enough to have Mike uh, give a talk for us a few years ago in Keith Ness, and he really is superb at explaining things. Uh, all events from the month-long Science Festival programme are free, but you do have to register attendance via the website uh, in advance, and in doing so you'll get the join-in instructions. So there are uh, web links there, uh, but to be honest, rather than try and remember them, if you Google, uh, type into Google uh, Keith Ness Astronomy Group or Keith Ness Science Festival, it will uh, come up at the top of the list. So it's quite easy to, to find. Uh, okay, so let's go on to the, the main topic. And that is celebrating how the Hubble Space Telescope has revealed the wonders of the universe, uh, really, to the, the masses across the, the planet Earth. Uh, the, the information that is generated has been made readily available for everybody to see. Now, because of the mind-boggling distances involved in uh, between us and the, the objects that are being ob observed, we're mostly limited to studying uh, celestial objects uh, through the light that we receive from them. And the Hubble Space Telescope has aided many scientific discoveries by doing this. Uh, but as I've said, perhaps the biggest success is the way it's stunning, beautiful images have captured the attention and imagination of people right across the earth. And I, for one, could sit for hours uh, just uh, browsing through all the images that have been produced. There's a small selection on the screen just now, and uh, at, at worst, they're eye-catching. At best, they're almost works of art. So before we talk a bit more about these images, let's talk a bit about the telescope itself. So the Hubble Space Telescope was launched into a low-Earth orbit aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery on the 24th of April 1990. So uh, that's obviously just over 30 years ago. It currently sits slightly higher uh, in orbit around the Earth than the International Space Station, and it takes just over one and a half hours to travel around the, glo the globe. Uh, although there are uh, optical uh, telescopes that have much larger mirrors in use. The largest telescope uh, on Earth, for instance, has a mirror 10.4 metres in diameter. Being up there in space, uh, the 2.4 metre mirror on Hubble has the advantage that it doesn't have to contend with the Earth's turbulent atmosphere degrading the view. Uh, so the, the sharper view and the ability to point very accurately at distant objects for extended periods has enabled it to obtain uh, outstandingly detailed views of our universe. Uh, so you can see from this image that I took, uh, the image on the right hand side of the screen, uh, it was taken at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and it's a full scale model of the Hubble Space Telescope. So you can see, uh, Somebody stand in the, the bottom right hand corner there. So the telescope is really quite large. Uh, it's pretty big, about the size and the weight of a bus. Now, one of the other important aspects of 
uh, the telescope is that it's a truly international collaboration. Uh, and it's operated jointly by NASA and the European Space Agency. So you can see from the, the country flags there, there are lots of different countries are uh, involved in funding and operating the telescope. And uh, one of the, the things that I, I find amazing is the information that's obtained, the images and the data is available for uh, uh, scientists to use across the, the world. So, these uh, diagrams that you can see on the screen uh, show the telescope and it consists of a number of key components uh, all required for its operation. Uh, the bottom illustration shows how the light enters the open end of the scope. Uh, let's see. So hopefully you can see my uh, uh, mouse moving here. So you can see the, the rays of light entering the end of the scope, traveling down the, the tube of the telescope and striking the main mirror at the bottom. This curved mirror then bounces the light halfway back up the telescope tube to a secondary mirror, which then bounces the, the light back in this direction out to the end of the telescope where all of the scientific instruments are uh, housed. So the camera and the other instruments are there. Looking at the, uh, the schematic above, uh, this end here is the open end of the telescope. Primary mirror is located in there and these are all the instruments. So these instruments are designed and constructed in removable modules and have allowed the telescope to be repaired and upgraded by astronauts on space shuttle missions over the earlier years of operation. Now, it just so happens that next month in the Caithness Science Festival, there are two events that have uh, Caithness Science Festival regular Dwayne Carey, uh, an astronaut, who, a NASA astronaut, who happens to be uh, uh, one of the astronauts that piloted the space shuttle uh, during a servicing mission uh, to do some uh, maintenance and upgrades to the telescope itself. So uh, I, I suppose it's, it's, it's quite good that this, uh, this talk here on the Hubble Space Telescope is preceding a couple of talks next month by one of the astronauts that actually went in the space shuttle to do work on the uh, telescope while it was in orbit. Let's get back to my apologies. My mouse pointer has disappeared. Right, there we go. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see the primary mirror uh, during uh, some inspection uh, just before installation in the telescope. Uh, now, Unfortunately, as history has shown, uh, it was just as well that the telescope was able to be reached for maintenance and servicing by the space shuttle and astronauts, because it turned out that the main mirror had a flaw introduced during manufacture. Uh, the flaw was that it was very accurately shaped, but it was slightly the wrong shape. So uh, I think the solution is now well known. Uh, and that is that uh, they manufactured the equivalent of a set of spectacles to correct the optics and then they sent uh, that equipment to space uh, to be fitted by astronauts to the, the telescope itself. Uh, this vastly improved the sharpness of the images obtained from the telescope as can be seen in the, uh, the three photos that you can see there. Uh, so the, the left-hand one was before uh, the spectacles were uh, put in place and you can see it was a massive improvement uh, when that happened and then a number of years later the, the camera equipment was upgraded and that just improved the sharpness, sharpness of the images a little bit more. So just to give you the, the full uh, effect of the Hubble images 
uh, that are achievable now after the upgrades and the initial optical correction. And this particular image here, the bit that you were looking at before was the center, the core of the galaxy, this part. Uh, and what you can see is the, the full extent of the galaxy uh, from the, uh, the, the Hubble image. And you can see the, the spiral arms curving out from the, the core of the galaxy there. Okay, so uh, next part is uh, about who Edwin Hubble was. And for that, I am going to hand over to uh, Neil McLean, who's going to briefly tell us a little bit about uh, the man that the telescope was named after. So Neil, I shall stop sharing my screen if you want to get ready for putting yours in view. All right, okay, indeed. Uh, hopefully we're gonna get this sorted out here. Um, Well then. We're having a little bit of a difficulty here uh, in that. How's that? Can everybody see the uh, the, sl the slideshow? Yep, that's good. Okay, dokey. All right, well, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to Caithness Astronomy Group's 30-year celebration of the Hubble Telescope. I guess anyone, even with a passing interest in the heavens, uh, has heard about the, the Hubble Telescope and just marvelled at some of the images that have appeared over the years, as, as Gordon uh, has said. Um, however, I, I wonder how many people have actually thought about uh, who or what was behind it. What was a Hubble? And I must confess, I didn't even consider that uh, when I saw the first images maybe uh, 20 odd years ago. Now, I'm not sure, is that advancing? Okay, so Edwin Hubble was born in 1889 and uh, um, as we know, died in 1953. Uh, of course, the, the, the Hubble telescope was named after uh, Edwin Hubble, one of the real uh, giants of modern astronomy. His early life, his father was John Powell Hubble and, and, and astonishingly, even with today's fantastic um, Wikipedia and all the rest of it, you cannot find an image of his father, John Powell Hubble. And the reason I put that there will be explained later. His mother, Virginia Lee uh, Powell, um, was a uh, mother to um, eight children, and uh, Jane, uh, Edwin was uh, born in uh, Marshfield, Missouri, on the 20th of November, 1889. The family moved to Wheaton, Illinois, near Chicago, when uh, Edwin was age 10, and uh, he was more renowned at school as an athlete, school and college as an athlete rather than an intellectual. And there we have, he was a gifted athlete, he played baseball, football, uh, running track in both high school and college. And he played in a, a variety of different positions on the basketball court from center shooting guard. In fact, he even led the University of Chicago's basketball team to the first conference title in 1907. And uh, at age 16, he won seven first places and a third place in a single high school uh, track and field uh, meet. Sorry, that was in 1906. So he was very much the athletic type of character rather than uh, someone who you would say was a, a, an intellectual. But in 1906, he won a scholarship to the University of Chicago, where he served for a year as a student lab assistant uh, for physicist Robert Milken, Millikan, uh, who was a former uh, Nobel Prize winner. He graduated from uh, uh, college in 1910 and was selected as a Rhodes School Scholar from Illinois. And so there, there we got the Chicago University. It's a bit iffy image, but uh, anyway, he spent, uh, he then, as a Rhodes Scholar, he went to Oxford um, <clears throat> and he was awarded a, a, a Bachelor of Arts in Jurisprudence, a subject he had taken at his father's insistence uh, rather than follow a, a career in astronomy. <clears throat> However, 
Edwin's father died in 1913 and he returned to America where he took up a post as a high school teacher in Indiana for a year. And following a year in teaching, Edwin entered the University of Chicago studying astronomy for the first time here and uh, carrying out his observational research at the Yerkes Observatory under the supervision of astronomer Edwin Frost. There must be something about Edwin's in astronomy. And although this instrument was not cutting edge, a 24 inch reflector, it was quite a powerful telescope. <clears throat> As he was completing his graduate studies, luckily for him, the director of the newly, well, about to be completed Mount Wilson Observatory, uh, George Ellery Hale, was looking for staff. And uh, Hubble accepted Hale's offer. And, uh, but before he could take up his position, the United States of America declared war on Germany. And uh, Edwin hastily completed his dissertation so that he could enlist in the army. So his dissertation was a photographic investigations of a uh, faint nebula. And you can see here his uh, American Expeditionary Forces ID card, um, which he would be issued with before taking off to uh, join the army in France. Although he rose to the rank of major and served in France, it's very unlikely that he saw any action. On his release from active service, George Hale had kept his post open at the uh, Mount Wilson Observatory. And this is where he initially studied reflection nebulae within the, uh, within the Milky Way. And of course, at that time, the Hooker 100 inch telescope was the most powerful instrument in, in the world at that time. And uh, his, picture of a reflection nebula. <laughs> However, he soon returned to the problem of the so-called spiral nebulae, objects he had studied for his doctorate. The status of spirals, as they were then known, uh, was unclear. Were they distant star systems like the Milky Way, or were they clouds of gas or sparse star clusters within or close to the Milky Way? The theory that they were nearby galaxy had fallen from favour uh, in the 19th century, but was revived in the early part of the 20th century. At the start of the 20s, astronomers believed there was no definitive evidence for this. However, Hubble was about to change that. Now, <clears throat> Hubble's study of the Cepheid variable stars in Andromeda, he determined that the nebula's distance using the relationship of the period of the Cepheid fluctuations and the luminosity and placed the Andromeda galaxy some 900 light, 900,000 light years distant. If Hubble was right, then the nebula lay far beyond the borders of the Milky Way, which was estimated to have a diameter of 300,000 light years. And Andromeda must therefore be a galaxy and not a nebulous gas cloud or a sparse star cluster. Hubble's work convinced the majority of astronomers that the universe in fact contained a myriad of galaxies. And he then turned his attention to the puzzle of what he termed extra galactic nebulae. Why did they appear to be moving away from Earth if the red shift in their spectra is a as a result of Doppler shift? In 1929, Hubble published his first paper on the relationship between red shift and distance. The general, uh, generally, the result of this work was by the mid-30s, the redshift distance relationship was generally accepted as a velocity distance, such that spectral shifts were as a result of their motion. But Hubble throughout his career resisted the definite identification of redshifts as velocity shifts. Hubble had hoped to shed light on this, in, uh, this uh, issue by investigating the numbers of extragalactic nebulae that lay at various distances in space. He conducted these studies in part with a distinguished mathematical physicist and chemist, Richard C. Tallman. And writing in the mid thirties, uh, however, Hubble and Tallman stressed the uncertainty of the observational data. They declined to choose publicly and unambiguously between a static and a non-static model of the universe. Hubble later argued that the evidence seemed to favor the concept of a stationary universe, but he did not definitely rule out an expanding universe. 
a good scientific inclusion there. So he actually produced little original research after the pub publication of this book, The Realm of the Nebula in 1936. By then he had done much, however, to lay down the methods and techniques that extragalactic astronomers used or had to take account of for decades to come. Moving along a bit, he came to the Second World War was upon us in 1939 and uh, Hubble worked as a civilian at the US Army at the Aberdeen Proving Ground in Maryland during World War II as the chief of external ballistics branch of the ballistics research lab during which he directed a large volume of research into exterior ballistics, which increased the effect of firepower bombs and projectiles. His work was facilitated by his personal development of several items of equipment uh, for instrumentation used in exterior ballistics, the most outstanding being the development of the high-speed clock camera, which made possible to study the characteristics of bombs and low-velocity projectiles in, fright, in flight. The results of his studies were credited with greatly improving design, uh, performance and military effectiveness of bombs and rockets. Uh, for his work there, he received the uh, Legion of Merit Award. Now you would think with the amount of work that he's done on laying down the basic techniques uh, and uh, uh, methods that, that the astronomers used for looking at the extra, uh, extra galactic nebulae, that surely there must be a Nobel Prize in physics coming somewhere along the time. However, at the time the Nobel Prize in physics didn't recognize work done in astronomy and Hubble spent much of the later part of his career attempting to have astronomy considered an area of physics instead of being its own science. He did this largely so that astronomers including himself could be recognized by the Nobel Prize Committee for their valuable contributions to astrophysics. His campaign was unsuccessful in Hubble's lifetime. But shortly after his death in 1953, the Nobel Prize Committee decided that astronomical work would be eligible for the physics prize. However, the prize is not one that can be awarded posthumously. <clears throat> uh, he married Grace uh, Lillian Lieb, uh, who's the daughter of John Patrick and Luella Burke on February uh, 26, 1924, and the, the couple they lived together until his death, uh, they having no children. Now then, Hubble had a heart attack in 1949 whilst he was on vacation in Colorado, but he was cared for by his wife and she continued uh, on a modified diet and work schedule. He died, unfortunately, of a cerebral thrombosis, uh, a blood clot in his brain on September the 28th, 1953 in San Marino, California. Right at the beginning, I showed you uh, an image, the only image I could find that related to his father. Unfortunately for, um, for us, I guess, uh, that no funeral was held for Edwin Hubble and his wife never ever revealed his burial site. So I hope I've given you just a little bit of information, a little bit of insight into the man, a uh, true giant of uh, modern astronomy. And uh, we look forward to seeing more of the stunning images produced by the telescope which bears his name. Gordon, thanks very much for that. That's great. Uh, thanks, Neil, for that bit of insight into uh, Edwin Hubble. Uh, I shall now, uh, as it's back to me for the, the next part, I'll share my screen while well, I'm sorting that out. Uh, I don't have sight of the Facebook side of things. Is there any questions coming in so far from that end? No questions at the moment, Gordon. Okay, that's, uh, that's good. Okay, 
So, am I sharing? Hopefully, what you can see is uh, three three people looking through telescopes. Is that uh, is that what everybody else is seeing? Excellent. Thank you for that thumbs up. Uh, so, you may actually recognise yourself in the middle there, John. So, the the next uh, small part of the this evening schedule. Uh, I'm going to have a run through a selection of objects that have been spectacularly imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. And I've selected them as examples of different types of objects that amateurs can fairly easily observe or image with modest equipment. So in each instance, I'll show, uh, as well as the, the spectacular Hubble image, uh, I'm going to show images that I've captured of the same objects for comparison. So uh, uh, obviously you're, you're not going to be too surprised that uh, what I've captured uh, from a back garden with a small telescope is far less impressive looking than the, uh, the, the glorious Hubble images. Uh, even though, as you can probably tell from uh, the example, uh, astronomer images that uh, you can see on the screen just now, uh, to capture those sort of images uh, with amateur equipment does tend to mean an awful lot of time and effort sitting or standing outside in the cold. So uh, there, there are certainly some nights where it, it feels like the, the end result uh, is hardly worth it because of the cold when you compare it against the, uh, the, the Hubble uh, version of the, uh, of the image. Right. Uh, it's also quite important for me to highlight at this point that if instead of imaging, uh, you go out to observe these objects through an amateur telescope, you're not going to see the, the wonderful, colourful uh, views that you get when you uh, look on a screen or in a book at Hubble Images. Unfortunately, that's just not what you're going to see. Uh, so if, if you're expecting that when you first look through a telescope, I'm, I'm afraid you will be quite disappointed. But uh, the what you do see can be uh, quite impressive uh, nonetheless, even if it's not visually as impressive as the Hubble, Hubble uh, images. It is travelling a very long distance, uh, the, the light from the object, and gathered in a small telescope uh, and focused into, into your eye. So uh, there, there is a sense of achievement in that, even if it isn't as uh, spectacular as you may hope. Uh, and the, the other thing is uh, clearly the, the Hubble telescope being a multi-billion dollar telescope operated by a, a large team of experts, you would hope that you would get some uh, quite impressive results from it. Uh, so when you see my images, uh, some of them try, try not to laugh uh, at how, how uh, feeble they, they look in comparison. OK, so let's start our target selection with relatively nearby objects. Uh, here we've got images of the planet Mars on the left and the largest planet in the solar system, Jupiter, on the right. Despite being a considerable distance from the Earth, the Hubble images of these planets show lovely detail, uh, including the change in weather systems. So on Mars on the left, the ice-capped poles and some of the clouds can be seen, as well as large features on the planet's surface, as shown by the sort of lighter and darker areas. On Jupiter, the belts of clouds and the giant storm known as the Great Red Spot can be seen in fabulous detail. It's over decades of operation, the telescope uh, has enabled scientists to monitor the changing conditions on these planets and other planets in the solar system. For instance, uh, on the far right hand side, there are three uh, images in sequence with many years in between, 
and they were taken by Hubble and they show that the Great Red Spot has shrunk from about three times the size of the Earth and it's now only about two times its diameter. Uh, so it, it's shrunk quite a bit, but I think we'll, we'll still agree that any storm that's twice the size of the Earth is uh, still quite, quite significant. These images have obviously been surpassed in detail in recent years by those taken by visiting spacecraft and planetary rovers. Uh, indeed, this month has seen sp spacecraft from the UAE and China arrive in orbit around Mars, and later this month, the NASA Mars rover Perseverance is due to touch down on the red planet's surface to search for past signs of life. Uh, so here's a couple of images uh, of the planets that I've captured. So I, I think you, you can easily see that they are the same planets uh, and the same sort of features are visible. Uh, it's just lacking the, uh, the, the detail of the, uh, the, the features of the planets themselves. Uh, but obviously amateur equipment can uh, obtain reasonable views of uh, our nearby planetary neighbours. Although the Hubble Space Telescope can capture great detail in distant objects, it's important to realise there are limitations. Uh, even pointing at our nearest neighbour, the Moon, uh, will not reveal astronaut footprints. Uh, and before anybody says, uh, that's not because they aren't there. Uh, of course they are. Uh, so, the Hubble image uh, shows the 93 kilometre diameter crater Copernicus. Uh, so you can see the, the crater there in the image. And zooming in on the detail, you can see the detail of the terraced walls uh, of, the, of the crater. And just for comparison's sake, on the right hand side is an image of the moon that I took with a small telescope and at the bottom you can hopefully see there the crater Copernicus. So amateur telescopes again can show quite a bit of detail of the moon and if the weather permits uh, in about five weeks time we will have some live observing of the moon as part of the Keith Ness Science Festival. So uh, for those that might want to join us that night, uh, check the Science Festival website uh, for details on how to join the live streaming event. The next object I've selected to look at is <coughs> uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy, also known as Messier 51. <coughs> Excuse me. This uh, stunning image uh, shows <coughs> a, the Whirlpool Galaxy and a uh, close by neighbouring galaxy undergoing a gravitational interaction. So in several billion years, our own Milky Way Galaxy and the neighbouring Andromeda Galaxy will interact in a similar way. Uh, but don't, don't panic, uh, that's well in the future. Sorry, excuse me for a second. I'm struggling with a, a frog in my throat. <coughs> <coughs> so uh, this is one of my favourite objects, both to observe and image. Uh, it's relatively bright and being face onto us, you can see the full spiral structure. It has a, an added advantage that its position in the sky, just below the handle of the plough, uh, means that it's always located above the horizon after dark, if observing from the north of Scotland, uh, such as in Caithness. In the Hubble uh, image, the gas and dust can be seen along the spiral arms, where there's also, uh, let me just show you, so you can see the spiral arms here, very clearly. Uh, so there's sort of brownish parts on the, the gas and dust uh, in the spinal arms. Uh, but there's also lots of red splodges there. And these are uh, produced by uh, light emission 
from hot glowing hydrogen gas that is in active star forming regions. So there's lots of new stars being formed in these spiral arms within the galaxy, uh, especially in the, uh, the, the red splodges. <coughs> Yeah, so there, there you go, that's a new technical term for, for this evening. And um, bottom right, uh, you'll see uh, an image that I captured of the, the same uh, pair of galaxies. Uh, so not, not quite so detailed, uh, the colours uh, a lot more difficult to capture, but you can clearly see the shape and structure. This image is of another galaxy. Uh, it's, uh, uh, referred to as a starburst galaxy uh, because of the, uh, the amount of uh, new stars being formed within it. It's <coughs> uh, also known as the Sicar Galaxy or Messi 82. Uh, so that's uh, number 82 in Charles Messier's catalogue. Uh, it's a galaxy that's remarkable for the uh, webs of shredded cloud and uh, plumes of glowing hydrogen that's blasting out from the central regions. So they're very obvious in this image. And that's where young stars have been born 10 times faster than they are inside our own Milky Way galaxy. So <coughs> when this galaxy is always alongside its spiral neighbour, uh, as I've done in the, uh, the image in the bottom right hand side, uh, you can see alongside uh, the uh, galaxy Messi 81 or Bode's galaxy, uh, it becomes quite obvious that galaxies come in lots of different shapes and forms. Uh, so they're not all spiral galaxies, some of them are uh, irregular shaped uh, or elliptical uh, shaped uh, is, the, is the more common ones. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, myself and other members of Keith Ness Astronomy Group have got special memories of Messier 82, the Cigar Galaxy. In 2014, myself and another member uh, who also lives in Thurzo, that's uh, Chris Sinclair, both imaged a supernova event in this galaxy the day before it was officially discovered. Uh, so my image, uh, the pre-discovery image, is shown in the top right hand uh, uh, corner of the, uh, the screen. And there's an arrow pointing to the supernova that appeared like a single bright star, uh, even though this galaxy is 12 million light years distant. So thanks to some clear skies, uh, a week or two later, Caithness Astronomy Group members all gathered around telescopes at an event that we put on especially for this and were able to observe firsthand light from this supernova event, this exploding star. Uh, so uh, quite, a, quite a memorable event and uh, good that we were able to uh, see it in case this, thanks to some nice clear skies at that time. Here, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, captured a coil of gas and dust and that from our viewpoint appears to be shaped like a horse's head. Uh, this was first discovered in 1888 by Williamina Fleming, a Scottish astronomer working at the Harvard College Observatory. Uh, the coil of gas and dust stands out uh, as it's silhouetted against a background of glowing hydrogen gas. So, it's not uh, shown quite the same in the, the Hubble photograph on the left hand side, but if you look in the bottom right is an image I took and you can see the dark horse's head nebula against the, uh, the glowing hydrogen gas behind. Uh, the top image uh, shows you where in Orion the Horsehead Nebula is. Unfortunately, you need quite a large telescope to capture, or to be able to see the Horsehead Nebula, uh, but it is below the left-hand star of the three stars of Orion's Belt, so in that region there. 
and you can see a, a bit further down is the Orion Nebula, which we're just about to uh, talk about next. So here we have uh, the Orion Nebula, uh, probably my uh, favourite uh, thing for imaging in the winter sky. Uh, and it's a mosaic of the, the nebula, uh, which has been sculpted and lit by several uh, young, extremely luminous stars at its centre. So amongst this glowing cloud of dust and gas, many other stars have been produced. And if you were able to uh, zoom right into the full resolution image, the new stars can be seen with uh, surrounding gas and dust destined to form into planetary systems. So there's four examples uh, shown there from the, uh, the zoomed in uh, view of the image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this object is readily visible to the naked eye from dark locations as a bright smudge of light below the three bright stars of Orion's belt. So quite easy to track down and uh, it's easy to observe with any kind of optical aid, whether it be binoculars or a small telescope, and can also be imaged quite easily with pretty basic equipment. Uh, and as a result, it is one target that amateurs uh, uh, tend to uh, point their imaging devices in the direction of uh, during the winter months. This image uh, shows a tiny part of the Seven Sisters star cluster, also known as the Pleiades or Messi 45. It's a relatively nearby cluster of bright young stars in the constellation of Taurus the Bull. And the, images, uh, the image here shows light from the bright star uh, Merope, which is just out of uh, the image on the top right. And the light from that bright star has been reflected off the nearby gas and dust. And the effect of the powerful stellar wind from the star can also be seen shaping the outer regions of the gas and dust cloud. So that's what's causing that, uh, that fine structure there that you can see uh, on, the, on the dust cloud. The Hubble Space Telescope can easily image large regions of the sky. So it would need to take a great many images and generate a, a mosaic to capture the entire Pleiades star cluster, as I've done uh, in the image in the bottom right hand side. <clears throat> this is where uh, small amateur telescopes with lower magnification uh, can readily achieve what the Hubble Space Telescope can't. So here's one instance where uh, th there is benefits in having the small amateur telescope uh, compared to Hubble, and that you can uh, you can image a, a larger part of the, of the sky itself. So, uh, what you can hopefully see is that around the brighter uh, blue stars, there is the reflected gas and dust. Uh, so that's referred to as a reflection nebula. Uh, uh, Here's a little uh, question for you to mull over between now and the end of the, the presentation. Uh, for any Harry Potter fans out there, I'm going to ask what's the link between this villainous character and the star Merope? So answers at the end of the presentation uh, and uh, the, there's no need to consult Google. Uh, I will give you the answer uh, in, the, in a little while. This image of Hubble, uh, image that Hubble took of the uh, great globular cluster in Hercules, shows a magnificent ball of approximately uh, two to three hundred thousand stars uh, located uh, along with uh, more than a hundred other globular clusters in a halo around our galaxy, the Milky Way. Uh, with the stars being fairly close together in these clusters, it's unlikely there will be any stable planetary systems. So it's, 
it's highly unlikely there'll be anything like uh, our solar system and planets around any of these stars. But just imagine if you could get to the centre of that star cluster. Uh, the, the night sky really wouldn't be very dark. There would be bright, uh, bright stars uh, dotted all across the, the sky. Certainly not uh, the, the, the sort of dark sky scenes that we get in the north of Scotland. Although quite small, uh, these clusters of stars are quite easy for amateurs to see through a small telescope and photograph with basic equipment. So there's my example in the bottom right. Uh, but clearly the Hubble Space Telescope gives the magnification and resolving power uh, that gives a real wow factor. The Ring Nebula in the constellation of Lyra is one of the most famous uh, planetary nebula and it's a popular target for amateurs looking uh, to see its somewhat unusual smoke ring-like appearance. Uh, so despite the name, the object has nothing to do with planets. It's a, a stage late in the life of stars, similar in mass to our sun, uh, when after expanding greatly in size to become a red giant, the star throws off its outer layers into space, leaving behind a small white dwarf star at the centre of an ever-expanding glowing shell of hot gas. So that glowing shell of hot gas is the, the ring that you're seeing uh, in the image. So although colourful, small amateur telescopes struggle to pro provide uh, much in the way of detail and certainly not uh, in the sort of beautiful detail that Hubble can obtain. Uh, so here we've got the last example uh, I want to uh, cover, and that's the, the Crab Nebula. It is a remnant of a supernova explosion that was observed and recorded in 1054, so almost a thousand years ago, uh, uh, and it was seen in the constellation of Taurus by Chinese astronomers. The shell of gas is currently about 11 light years in diameter, so that's pretty big, and it's expanded about half, half a percent of the speed of light. So that gas and dust is spreading into space at quite a rate. At its centre is a neutron star that was discovered by Professor Dame Jocelyn Bell Burnell. And this incredibly fast rotating object is the dead core left behind when the original very massive star exploded. The last six objects that I select to illustrate uh, many of the key uh, are, that I selected all illustrate many of the key stages in the life cycle of stars. So with a bit of uh, planning beforehand, amateurs are able to spend less than an hour outside and observe similar objects are examples of how stars evolve and eventually come to the end of their life cycle. So what they do is starting in the top left hand corner and going clockwise, they start off <coughs> uh, from clouds of gas and dust uh, and collapse uh, to form new stars uh, and then these stars will shine for millions and millions of years before coming to the end of their, their life. And that's dependent on the mass of the star. So if it's sun-sized mass, you get a planetary nebula. And if it's a very massive star, much heavier than our sun, then you get a supernova explosion. And both of these end of life events uh, throw uh, material back into inter interstellar space, which can then ultimately be recycled to be the next batch of stars. So observations made by the Hubble Space Telescope over the decades it's been in operation have helped greatly with the understanding of the stellar life cycle. And there's lots of other things that uh, Hubble has helped us understand. And that's where I'm going to hand over to Ian Darby to cover 
uh, a few, not all, but a few of the scientific discoveries made possible by the telescope. Okay, not so, too swiftly because you have some vast number of compliments on absolute jealousy of how great your photos are. And well, that's that's uh, that, that, that's good to hear. Yeah, uh, so, as well, so uh, we have a few questions for you, Gordon, if you wouldn't mind doing at this point as well. Okay, no problem. So uh, on Facebook, Stephen McConnick, uh, apologies if I pronounced it wrong, uh, asks. How does the Hubble telescope manage to maintain hours of exposure while orbiting the Earth without image shift? Uh, the simple answer to that is I don't know exactly uh, because it's not something I've looked into in detail, uh, but it does have uh, a number of gyroscopes that it uses to uh, uh, allow it to point in the direction it wants or in the direction it needs to do the imaging. Uh, I believe a, a few of those gyroscopes have in recent years stopped working and we're now getting pretty close to uh, having the below the minimum number required for it to work effectively. Uh, so that, that's kind of bad news now that the space shuttle has been retired and there's no easy way to go up and uh, repair it so that it can continue uh, to be operated. But the, the, the fine detail of how it manage, manages to point and stay pointed extremely accurately. Uh, I, 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 the, there are some mind boggling uh, uh, numbers that uh, I remember reading and I, I can't remember if I'm getting this exactly right, but if if it was to fire a laser as uh, showing where it's pointing at, and you put a one pence piece about 200 miles away, it would maintain its pointing at that whilst whizzing around the earth at 17,000 miles per hour. So uh, to be honest, that doesn't, to me, that, albeit I'm not an engineer, that, that, that sounds like an impossible feat, but uh, it, it is achieved somehow, and I don't know uh, the exact detail, the exact engineering details of how, uh, but uh, Stephen, next time I see you, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to you having uh, uh, looked up the answer, seen as, seen as you're the engineer between us. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the curiosity will get the better of you. But I'm pretty certain these gyroscopes will have uh, some part to play in all that. Okay, uh, uh, next is question. there any other ones? Yep, next question is from Christian, uh, who asks, what type of telescope would you need to capture the Horsehead Nebula? Uh, the, the, to be honest, I've, I've managed to image the, the Horsehead Nebula with a digital SLR camera and uh, around about a hundred millimeter uh, focal length lens, but it has to be on a tracking mount and it has to be imaging from somewhere reasonably dark. Uh, the other problem you have is th uh, if you do it that way, the digital SLR camera is not terribly efficient at capturing the emitted red light that provides the, the background lighting to the, the nebula. So uh, th there are better camera arrangements that will show it up uh, far clearer. Uh, so you, I suppose in answer, you don't need terribly sophisticated equipment, uh, but your, your, your most basic equipment is going to struggle because it is quite faint. It's not the same as the uh, the Orion Nebula, which is very close to it, that, to be honest, if you pointed a uh, uh, digital SLR with a, uh, a, say, a 100 millimeter focal length or longer lens at it from a static tripod, you could image that in a five or 10 second exposure and get reasonable results. Uh, so you don't need any terribly fancy equipment for it because it is much brighter than the horse end. Uh, so the, the, the bottom line, uh, Christian, is you, you probably want a camera sensitive to the hydrogen alpha 
uh, wavelength emissions. Uh, so you get the nebulosity behind the uh, the horse head itself, and you're going to need to do a long exposure. Uh, so a relatively fast telescope or lens is useful on a tracking mount. So hopefully that helps. Any um, others? Um, yep, next question. Uh, so Christian says, thank you for the details on capturing the Horsehead Nebula. And uh, next one's from our friend Pete Sher Peter Sherman. Uh, Gordon, what software do you use to make your mosaics? Uh, <coughs> to do the mosaics, if, if I'm doing, uh, and I didn't show any tonight, but if I'm doing wide field views of the sky, uh, and I'm, I'm capturing a number of images to do a panorama or a, a large uh, pane view, I I tend to use uh, Adobe Lightroom uh, simply because it, it seems to work. But for mosaics of the moon, uh, I would use uh, Microsoft Image Composite Editor. So that's free uh, software. Uh, from Microsoft, it's extremely good, and you could also use that for uh, doing the, the wide field uh, mosaics as well. Uh, the, the, the one thing, thing I, I do find is uh, if the, the mosaic is from raw files from a uh, uh, digital SLR, then uh, Lightroom will deal with those, but Image Composite Editor tends to need you to convert each of the things to uh, another file format. Uh, I generally use TIFF uh, because it, it avoids losing any of the detail, but uh, you could also convert it to a JPEG and merge them together that way. Uh, so <clears throat> I think the, the, the one I would recommend is Image Composite Editor. It works very good. Uh, I've, I've had far less failures with it than I have and trying any other software. And it really is a couple of clicks and it does it all for you. So it's not uh, it's not difficult to use. So hopefully that answers your, your question, Pete. If not, you know where to find me. I can uh, I can provide more details if you if you need. Okay. So we, we, there, there is more, but I, I feel we should ration it out and uh, do yeah. save some for the next break. Yeah, I, th I think it's important to believe some of the harder ones for uh, for yourself and uh, Neil at the end. Uh, yeah, yeah, so I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, so if you want to uh, take over, Ian. So can I get a confirmation that it all looks good? Okay, looks good. So, um, my turn. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. And uh, I've got a slightly different take on things this evening. So I've got uh, to do near enough the impossible um, on the world's greatest scientific instrument, pick a few science things to tell you about. So I'm going to try anyway. So uh, science with a hubble. Uh, I've got a nice quote from a book that I've got uh, from when I was an undergraduate. Uh, universe uh, and uh, in it is a cracking quote. Astronomers dream for decades of having one large telescope that could be operated at any wavelength from the near infrared through the visible range and out into the ultraviolet and boy did they get what they wanted. Um, you'll see this quote twice. Uh, Hubble has made many contributions to science since its launch in 1990. Uh, some estimates are more than 15,000 scientific papers attributed to it which would make a uh, Hubble by some measures the most productive scientific instrument ever built. So if anyone in the audience is funding science, it is a good investment. So a quick uh, recap of what Gordon said about you know, the fact that we won't see the same things um, through our ground-based telescopes that uh, we see through Hubble, not least because we're on the ground, but also because Hubble does a different job to what we are trying to do with most of our equipment. So in this case, uh, I've got a nice video in a minute because I'm a great believer in letting people, other people do things where they're doing it better than me. 
So what you've got here is a slide, again, fundamentally lazy, stolen from Gordon, um, in which case you can see the way the images are reconstructed. What you have to remember is that Hubble's taking black and white images. What it's measuring is effectively photon counting. It's measuring the intensity of light. Uh, the rest of it is by interpretation of us, uh, some form of narrow or broadband filtering and some application and choices of what we want a color to represent. That then gives us contextual information about how we want to understand the image. So we generally, see, as you'll see from the video, uh, this is a nice video from Vox, generally we see uh, combinations of RGB uh, obviously, this makes us blind to ultraviolet and near infrared. Uh, but equally, you can assign those colors to physical processes. And then having some understanding of the physics of what's going on, you can use a particular wavelength of light or shifted wavelength of light to track uh, information uh, based on a science process that you believe is taking place and see if you can learn anything about it. So what's next is uh, a nice video. Uh, my slide is Colour of Science, which is by Vox. And uh, I think it was quite informative, which is why I'm going to share it now. This is all the light in the universe that we can see. It's just a fraction of what's out there. Most frequencies of light are actually invisible to us. The light we can see appears red at its lowest frequencies and violet at its highest. This is called the visible spectrum, and we see it because cells in our eyes called cones interpret light reflecting off of objects. We have three different types of cones that are sensitive to long, medium, and short wavelengths of light, which roughly correspond to red, green, and blue on the visible spectrum. These are the primary colors of light. Every other color is some combination of these three. And that combination is the guiding principle in colorizing black and white images. This portrait was taken in 1911. I know, you came here for space photos. We're getting there, I promise. It's one of the first examples of color photography and it's actually three black and white photos composited together. Russian chemist Sergei Prokhodin Gorsky took three identical shots of this man, Alim Khan, using filters for specific colors of light. One allowed red light to pass through, one allowed green, and one allowed blue. You can really see how effective this filter system is when you compare the red and blue exposures. Look how bright Khan's blue robe is in the photo on the right, meaning more of that color light passed through the filter. Dying and combining the three negatives gives you this. All right, you get the idea. So let's take. The Hubble Space Telescope has been already expanding human vision Sorry. into deep space Sorry. and giving us images like this one. The thing is, every Hubble image you see started out black and white. That's because Hubble's main function is to measure the brightness of light reflecting off objects in space, which is clearest in black and white. The color is added later, just like the portrait of Alim Khan, except today, scientists use computer programs like Photoshop. Let's use this photo of Saturn as an example. Filters separate light into long, medium, and short wavelengths. This is called broadband filtering since it targets general ranges of light. Each of the three black and white images are then assigned a color based on their position on the visible spectrum. The combined result is a true color image, or what the object would look like if your eyes were as powerful as a telescope like Hubble. Okay, now one with Jupiter. See how combining the red and green brings in yellow? And then adding blue brings cyan and magenta to fully represent the visible spectrum. Watch this animation two more times, and I think you'll see it. Great, now let's add another level of complexity. Seeing an object as it would appear to our eyes isn't the only way to use color. Scientists also use it to map out how different gases interact in the universe to form galaxies and nebulae. Hubble can record very narrow bands of light coming from individual elements, like oxygen and carbon, and use color to track their presence in an image. This is called narrowband filtering. The most common application of narrowband filtering isolates light from hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen, three key building blocks of stars. Hubble's most famous example of this is called the Pillars of Creation, 
which captured huge towers of gas and dust forming new star systems. But this isn't a true color image like the one of Saturn from before. It's more of a colorized map. Hydrogen and sulfur are both seen naturally in red light and oxygen is more blue. Coloring these gases as we'd actually see them would produce red, red, and cyan. And the pillars of creation would look more like this. Not as useful for visual analysis. In order to get a full color image and visually separate the sulfur from the hydrogen, scientists assign the elements to red, green, and blue according to their place in the chromatic order. Basically, that means that since oxygen has the highest frequency of the three, it's assigned blue. And since hydrogen is red but a higher frequency than sulfur, it gets green. The result is a full color image, mapping out the process by which our own solar system might have formed. The Hubble Space Telescope can record light outside of the visible spectrum too, in the ultraviolet and near-infrared bands. An infrared image of the pillars of creation, for example, looks very different. The longer wavelengths penetrate the clouds of dust and gas that block out visible light frequencies, revealing clusters of stars within it and beyond. These images showing invisible light are colored the same way. Multiple filtered exposures are assigned a color based on their place in the chromatic order. Lowest frequencies get red, Middle get green, highest get blue. Which could beg the question, are the colors real? Yes and no. The color represents real data, and it's used to visualize the chemical makeup of an object or an area in space, helping scientists see how gases interact thousands of light years away, giving us critical information about how stars and galaxies form over time. So even if it isn't technically how our eyes would perceive these objects, it's not made up either. The color creates beautiful images, but more importantly, it shows us the invisible parts of our universe. So I'm hoping I'm still with you all. Uh, can I just check if somebody can see me? Um, can anyone else hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Excellent, thank you, sorry. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, if I touch anything in my screens, it breaks everything else, so my apologies for the video dipping out. So the the, came, the thing I kind of wanted to pick up in that was, uh, is it, I, I, I really liked that last part at the end, is, is it real? Um, well, it's real because it tells us something we want to know and it represents human creativity and ingenuity and interest. So would that be what our, the fleshy orb in our skull sees, no, but it, it, it does tell us something and it is part of what we're trying to look at. So that's fundamentally why we can't see what it can see, but it does other things for us. So what is, what is it doing? How does it do it? Gordon already showed this image. Um, I've got so, uh, a few additional remarks uh, on the combination of the instruments. So. Uh, you can see there the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph. Uh, this is a versatile combi in instrument. Uh, it takes advantage of modern technologies and it covers uh, the near-infrared region into the ultraviolet. Uh, in this case, the spectrograph reads out the light gathered by a telescope so that it can be analysed to determine the properties of the celestial objects. And what always comes back in this is we're effectively trying to bring back uh, nuclear chemistry, nuclear physics, uh, stellar nuclear synthesis, uh, understanding chemical composition uh, from observables that you can see from the stars. So we're trying to see things like uh, abundances, intensities, temperature, radio velocity, rotational velocity. Uh, and this gets even more creative into using uh, information to infer uh, values from magnetic fields. Uh, the, the STES, the imaging spectrograph, can be switched between two modes. It can do long set spectroscopy, where a spectra of many different points across an object are obtained simultaneously, or a shell spectroscopy, where one spectrum of, of one object is spread over the detector, and this gives a better wavelength resolution in a single exposure. But it's an either or. Uh, next down, uh, one going down is the cosmic origin spectrograph. Uh, and this is really targeted to look at the large scale structure of the universe and the formation and, and evolution of galaxies, stars and planets. And it's this uh, exploitation of the evolution of galaxies that's going to kind of, you know, to be my highlight. 
Uh, what the cause helps to do is determine the formation of elements considered to be essential for life, which is carbon and iron. Um, as a spectrograph, cause doesn't capture the kinds of images that have made Hubble famous, but it performs the spectroscopy, which is this the breaking up of the light into individual components. So less sexy images, but more information that you want to uh, be able to interpret and try and build into the models. This is, uh, if I pick up a Neil's point of why was astronomy not uh, included for the new Nobel Prize in Physics? Well, and it sure is now because all the observations of astronomy and astrophysical processes are feeding into our understanding of the basic principles of physics and act as an observational mechanism to test our assumptions. Uh, I think most famously is uh, Einstein's relativity. So uh, in this case for the cause, uh, it's based on the fact that we're looking at the emission and absorption preferentially of different lines to be able to understand temperature density and chemical composition of the thing that it's passing through. Uh, and Gordon's picked up on this a couple of times. The star is shining bright behind the glass gas cloud. The light comes through and you see the secondary emission from the gas. You're no longer seeing the, the direct emission from the, uh, the star. And cause, like what uh, has been discussed a, a couple of times now, is really working outside of the visible range. So it's the far ultraviolet channel and the near ultraviolet channel. Its science goals really are uh, origin large scale structure. Uh, so this is beyond even the evolution of the, of the galaxies and the intergalactic medium, not the interstellar medium, which is a bit more about the, um, the, the Orion Nebula and the star clouds that we can see, uh, the gas clouds that we can see. Uh, and then uh, it can lead through into the, because it's the ultraviolet, the origins of stellar and planetary systems. Uh, next instrument, uh, near infrared uh, camera and multi object, object spectrometer, NICMOS. Uh, no longer working, as I'll get to in a bit, but uh, hey, superhero, uh, it really captured some of the best stuff. So this is an instrument that provides the capability for infrared imaging and spectroscopic observations of astronomical targets, and it is responsible for a lot of the really cool images that you're going to want, that we're going to be talking about. Uh, its infrared capabilities are, were largely superseded by the wide field uh, camera three, um, and uh, from that instrument's installation in the service of Mission 4. Uh, but NICMOS is not currently in operation, but a lot of the images that you'll see and go, wow, uh, are from the days of when NICMOS was operating. Uh, coming around the corner, we've got, uh, and again, this goes to the, the fact, as Gordon mentioned, it's modular system, so it gets exchanged. We've got the advanced camera system, uh, and that replaced the Hubble's faint object camera during service of Mission 3B. Uh, its wavelength range uh, extends from ultraviolet through to visible and then out into the near infrared. Uh, it's referred to as a third generation Hubble instrument uh, and it's really increased Hubble's potential for new discoveries by an order of magnitude. Uh, the name, the ACS, the Advanced Camera for Surveys, comes from its particular ability to map large areas of the sky in great detail. Uh, but it can also perform spectroscopy with a special optical tool called a GRISM. And yes, I have another video. And in that video, you'll see one of the Easter scientists uh, show you an example of a GRISM. Um, finally, coming around the, the, the bottom corner, we've got Wavefield Camera 3. Uh, and the installation of Wavefield Camera 3 during service in Mission 4 uh, continued the pioneering tradition of previous Hubble cameras while incorporating critical improvements. So it was clearing the way for a whole new range of super discoveries. So to, the wide field camera together with COS uh, led the way to, to, to lots more interesting measurements. And the thing that's interesting about the wide field camera is two channels, one for ultraviolet and then one for visible light and then the other for near, near infrared. So, uh, and its science goals were just about everything. Uh, observations, uh, stellar archaeology, a cracking term, so the, you know, the history and evolution of stars, distribution of galaxies at high redshift, observations in the near infrared, look to try and understand the highest redshift galaxies, uh, water and ice on planetary moons, so we're going from the furthest, deepest, darkest, closest horizons to the Big Bang to what's happening on our nearest lookalike neighbour. Uh, uh, and uh, then, of course, star birth, death, and the interstellar medium, uh, which is all the really cool pictures that we can see that Gordon's shown uh, several times. 
On the top side, you'll see FGS, the fine guidance census. No clever picture in this one, but this is the thing that makes it point nicely. So it's a large structure housing a collection of mirrors, lenses, servos, prisms, beam splitters, and photomultiplier tubes. And it uses these uh, three fine guidance sensors located around the circumference of the telescope. Uh, two fine guidance sensors point the telescope at targets and hold that target in the scientific instrument's field of view. The third FGS is then used as an instrument for astrometry. Uh, so if you're interested in terms, you could metrology and other things like this. And typically the, the best FGS is used for this purpose, which usually means the newest one, the one that's been installed recently. So astrometry is the science of determining the precise positions and motions of stars. Uh, and the FGS can determine the positions to position 10 times greater than based on ground observations. Why do you care? Uh, that's all the information that goes into your catalogs to be able to do your automatic iPhone pointing at your telescope at the sky when you want it to happen. So uh, pretty pictures of all the really cool instruments. And uh, that didn't work, so I'll try it this way. So uh, repeating my previous quote, Hubble has made many contributions, 15,500. Um, so thank you, Gordon, uh, pick one. Um, well, uh, there are things you could pick. Um, Hubble, uh, the, in preparation and justification, top rank scientific justification for Hubble was uh, separate variables. Uh, so to look at the size and age of the universe, uh, and this was so important that it was the thing that put the constraints in the lower limit of Hubble's primary mirror. So this is the special type of variable star with very stable and predictable brightness variations uh, so that you can observe them in different galaxies and then be able to work out distances. Um, that leads into you know, the Hubble constant, the expansion of the universe. It's the core purpose, I suppose, if you think of what the instrument's for. Um, having said all that, that would take me a huge talk and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pick something else and I'm going to pick the Hubble Deep Fields. Um, because to be honest, I just love the fact that, as you'll see in this video, uh, after fantastically having spectacular quantities of egg on their face uh, with a telescope that, as you'll see in the video, Al Gore complains that they spent billions of dollars and they didn't and then they had to go and fix it then the head of the program decides that he would point it at a bit of the sky that didn't have any stars and um, fantastic cojones and um, so anyway here here's the video that explains the hubble deep fields Since the Hubble Space Telescope went into orbit back in April 1990, it has sent back a ton of incredible photos. Each has its own story, but one of Hubble's greatest images is this one from 1995. This is a snapshot of nearly the entire history of the universe and the first of its kind. The Hubble Deep Field is an unusual image that came from an unusual process. Typically, astronomers apply to use Hubble to look at a particular known object. You want to study a star? Okay, you know what stars you're going to study. You point the telescope at that star. That's Robert Williams. He became director of the telescope in 1983. It was his decision to create the deep field image by pointing the telescope at nothing in particular. What we were doing basically was just the opposite. We were trying to find a sort of an indiscriminate area of the sky where no observation had been made before. They wanted to test how well Hubble could survey very distant galaxies, but they didn't know what they'd see. And it wasn't a great time to be trying new things. After spending $2 billion for 12 years, to have this kind of unexpected, very large mistake take place. The Hubble team was still repairing the reputation of the telescope after a flaw in the main mirror produced blurry images for nearly three years. We were at the front of jokes and the newspapers, political cartoons, you know, Johnny Carson show. NASA was being made fun of for having made such a monumental screw up of such an expensive project. NASA sent astronauts on a five day mission to install a module that would fix the problem, and it worked. <laughs> So Williams' team spent 1995 planning the deep field observation. 
For one thing, they had to decide where to point the telescope. The goal was to see far beyond our galaxy, so the spot needed to be away from the galactic plane of the Milky Way and away from any known large galaxy clusters. They didn't want anything bright to block the view. And to get continuous observations, it needed to be a location that wouldn't be obscured when Hubble went around the Earth, as it does every hour and a half or so. They settled on a region just above the Big Dipper, a dark, unremarkable peephole into the universe. The field of view was extremely narrow. Astronomers measure the apparent size of objects in the sky in angular degrees, and a degree can be divided into 60 arc minutes. From Earth, the moon is about half a degree across, around 30 arc minutes. But the area that Hubble photographed was just 2.6 arc minutes across. A little larger than a pinhead at arm's length. The teeny patch of sky. The observations began on December 18, 1995, collecting four different wavelengths of light. And over the next 10 days, the telescope took 342 images of that teeny patch of sky. We, we were relieved that we were getting good data, but we had to uh, keep adding it up. And so it wasn't until 10 days that we realized, oh, we really got something. There are a few nearby stars in the image, but pretty much all the other objects here, including these tiny blue dots, they're galaxies. The light from these different galaxies has been traveling for vastly different amounts of time. So the furthest galaxies are shown pretty early in their evolution, more than 12 billion years ago. That's just a billion and a half years after the Big Bang. It's as if you could point a telescope across the Earth and actually photograph ancient Egypt with a Neanderthal in the background, and then further back, there's a dinosaur. The research team sampled another tiny spot two years later, this time in the southern sky. We wanted to know, okay, then we got one spot of the sky. You never know, maybe it was some weird spot. So we thought it was important to repeat the observation. The data sets boosted estimates of the total number of galaxies. They allowed researchers to track the history of star formation through the universe. And they helped confirm the bottom-up theory of galaxy formation by revealing galaxies that are small and irregular early in their evolution. But one of the most important legacies of the Hubble Deep Field is how it changed the culture of astronomy. Until this time, astronomy had a history of people taking the data and keeping it to themselves until they had fully analyzed it. After all, this is intellectual property. Instead of hoarding the discoveries embedded in the data set, Williams and his team formatted and released it immediately to the wider scientific community. It's been cited in hundreds of papers. Nowadays, it is. Uh, much more common for people to take interesting observations and make the data available to the public, even though they might have a right to keep it for a certain period of time to themselves. Thanks to servicing missions that installed more advanced cameras, Hubble has since made even deeper deep field images, and those data, too, were released to the public. I think it moves forward the march of human understanding, human knowledge, tremendously, and the Hubble Deep Field did that. So there is it. So I have to stop that. So um, I have one more video because I, I think we should hear the ESA guys talk and you can hear them describe the instruments. Uh, there's a couple of uh, things that are really uh, important to me uh, in that, that, that video uh, for some of the people who know me. Uh, open science. Uh, I, I'm an advocate of citizen science and open hardware and sharing and transparency. And uh, I, I think to hear from the, the man who had said, uh, as he described it, the fact that the data set then became open. Uh, I recall uh, from hearing from Professor Chris Collins and uh, Liverpool GMU, you know, that this is one of the big things is the fact that uh, these catalogues, these observations were made, the, the science was justified, and then beyond the individual scientists who proposed it, a uh, huge uh, amount of other people were then able to go and investigate the data. And this is just uh, to the benefit of everyone, which I, which I think is marvelous. So I, I, I don't have too many more videos. I promise you have to listen to me drone on for the second half. But what's really good about this is that it kind of gives a nice demonstration of what the scientists were thought they were trying to uh, go after. Uh, and then there's some there's just some cool shots of what they're up to that's far better than I could produce sat in my little cabin in Northern Scotland. So here's the, the next video.
Why would anyone aim the world's most sophisticated telescope at the same piece of sky for 28 days in a row? Answer, because it allows astronomers to see much further out and further back in time than ever before. American and European scientists today unveil the deepest portrait of the visible universe ever achieved by humankind, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. Located in the constellation of Fornax, just below the constellation of Orion, the Hunter, the image spans just one-tenth of the diameter of the full moon, but reveals an estimated 10,000 galaxies. The ultra-deep field shows galaxies that are two to four times fainter than Hubble could see previously, so Hubble takes us to within the stone sphere of the big bang itself. <laughs> The first Hubble Deep Field was in 1995, when this uh, experiment was first proposed. An experiment consisting of staring at the same patch of the sky for weeks. Nobody really knew what they would have led to see interesting scientific results. But when we first saw the images, the result was astonishing. We could see more than 3,000 galaxies in this small field, and we could definitely tell that the Hubble Deep Field has opened a new era in artificial cosmology, transforming our view. After the first deep field, almost all ground and space-based telescopes were then pointed to the same area for long periods. Some of the most interesting results in astronomy emerged from these fruitful synergies between instruments of different sizes, in different environments, and with sensitivity to different wavelengths. These impressive dips into the depths of space and time have provided astronomers with the first glimpse of the history of young galaxies when the universe was only one billion year old. This has been one of the greatest and one of the strongest legacies of the Hubble Space Telescope. The new Hubble Ultra Deep Field image is studded with a wide range of galaxies of various sizes, shapes, and colors. These faint galaxies give fossil clues as to how the universe looked in the remote past and how it may have evolved over time. Astronomers expect many fascinating scientific results to emerge from the city. For instance, the discovery of distant signals that will help understand the past and future of the universe. Undoubtedly, the image will also hold a number of surprises that will lead to unexpected discoveries. One of the great things about the problem is that there are many different instruments involved in the telescope that can make different observations at the same time. So what we're doing here is that we're analyzing data and taking an instrument that basically splits the light up into a rainbow of colors. And those observations are made with a grism like this one here. And they basically allow us to study the physical properties of galaxies in a lot of detail and really work out things more colors. This historic new view is actually two separate images taken by two instruments. Hubble's ACS camera and the Nikos instrument. The combination of ACS and Nikos images will be used to search for galaxies that existed between 800 and 400 million years after the Big Bang. Nikos sees even further than the ACS. It reveals the furthest galaxies ever seen because the expanding universe has stretched their light into the near infrared portion of the spectrum. When Hubble looks at the very distant universe, he looks back in time. We could try to sketch this. If this is the Hubble Space Telescope, here we are, 14 billion years after the Big Bang. The first Hubble Deep Field was able to see up to here, 12 billion years of cosmic history. This new Ultra Deep Field pushed this exploration to go further back in time. For the first time, we can access the first big year of cosmic history. And for the first time, we can see the first stars, the first galaxies, which formed right at the end of the so-called dark ages. The NASA ESA Hubble Ultra Deep Field is likely to remain the deepest image of the universe for the next decade or so, until it... So, uh, sorry, uh, I've just seen the message there, some distorted image, the, the sound's got distorted. It's near the end there, my apologies for that. Uh, uh, I'm not in control of that. Uh, possibly it's the fact that my fan is, uh, is running too hot. So uh, skipping on, uh, I think you uh, uh, hopefully you got the image there. Was the point was that as it gets through to the end, uh, the 
I, I put there the Hubble Deep Field, but it's obviously not just one image. Uh, I'm referring to the fact that they've, they've done this several times. Uh, the Ultra Deep Field image, and, the, and they've made several of them. So uh, a sequence of, to try and understand what, you know, to me, it was quite amazing. In fact, you just point this, this, the, the telescope at a dark bit of sky. Uh, I almost kind of find it the, the funny part of the reverse of Obers paradox, you know, why is the, 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 the night sky not full of stars? But if you look back far enough in time, it is full of bright objects. It just happens to be galaxies, you know, 12 billion years ago. I think it's really cool. Um, so uh, biggest thing for, for you know, I, I, you could make an argument for uh, for Hubble is probing the origin and evolution of galaxies and the large scale structure of the universe. The, the Hubble deep field data provided extremely rich material for cosmologists to analyze. And by late 2014, the associated scientific paper for the ultra deep field image, the Hubble deep field images, over 900 citations. Uh, one of the most fundamental findings was the discovery of a large number of galaxies uh, with high redshift values. Uh, as the universe expands, uh, more distant objects recede from the Earth faster. Uh, and this is referred to as the Hubble flow. Uh, the light from very distant galaxies is significant effect, significantly affected by this cosmological redshift. Uh, so while some quasars with high redshifts were known, there were very few galaxies with redshifts greater than one were known before the Hubble deep field image uh, was produced. Uh, that image, however, contained many galaxies with redshifts as high as six, uh, so corresponding to a redshift of about 12 billion years. Uh, due to the redshift, the, the most distant objects in the Hubble deep field images um, uh, could only actually be detected by ground telescopes. And I think this is an important point not to forget is, uh, you know, we're celebrating Hubble and it's super and fantastic, but there's complementary measurements to be made from ground-based astronomy as well. So the fact, and you see this uh, as we'll get to in some of the supernova and in stuff that we're not going to talk about where there is a whole bunch of, uh, you can't see me terribly, sorry. Uh, hi, uh, I don't like to sit there, you know, looking kind of weird while I watch videos. Sorry, John. Um, so hopefully you can see me again now. So kind of the point then is that, uh, I, I, was, I was making there was just the fact that don't forget about the ground telescopes. They're, they're really particularly useful and they do things that the, you know, the cost and expense of getting stuff up into orbit just can, can't achieve. Um, the Hubble deep field galaxies contained a considerably larger proportion of disturbed and irregular galaxies than the local universe. Uh, and gal galaxy collisions and mergers were, uh, we infer, were much more common in the young universe uh, and the universe was smaller than it is today. It's believed that the giant elliptical galaxies uh, therefore formed when spirals and irregular galaxies co collided. Uh, the wealth of galaxies at different stages of their evolution uh, have allowed astronomers to estimate the variation in the rate of star formation over the lifetime of the universe. You know, so population one stars coming through all the way through. Obviously, we see galaxies because we see stars. They don't exist independently. Therefore, if you understand more about the evolution of galaxies, we can infer something about the, the, the original population of stars. Um, so while the estimates of the redshifts of uh, the galaxies are somewhat crude, crude, astronomers believe that star formation was probably occurring at its maximum rate of about 8 to 10 billion years ago. Uh, and it's then decreased by about a factor of 10 since then. So. Uh, if it seems like I'm going on, it's because it's just got a huge amount of science behind it. So another important result from the, uh, the deep field was the very small number of foreground stars that were present. So uh, for years, and we still, you know, to a certain extent still doing this, uh, astronomers have been puzzling over the nature of dark matter. Uh, that mass, which seems undetectable, uh, but which observations imply must be about 85% of all matter in the universe. One theory is that the dark matter might consist of uh, massive astrophysical compact halo objects, machos, but faint massive objects such as uh, dwarfs and planets um, in the outer region of galaxies could be there. Uh, the deep field showed that there was not significant numbers of red dwarfs in the outer part of our galaxies. So it kind of revealed that there wasn't a, a, a large amount of mass hiding in plain sight, it just wasn't bright enough for us to see. It turns out that actually you can't see it because it's not there and therefore you see the galaxies. So 
that's going to bring me to the end of the ultra cool Hubble deep field, uh, which was ignoring Cepheid variables and the purpose of the cosmological constant and all that other stuff, you know, stuff that we can talk forever from. Um, the Hubble deep field is going to be up there with one of the coolest things that anyone ever had a really ballsy idea to do. Um, so to come back to uh, what Gordon teed up, which is uh, life cycles of stars and stellar, stellar evolution, um, he's showing some pictures and I'm just going to pick up one of his slides and try and show a couple of different uh, other images uh, and some emerging scientific papers to give you a feel for other things other than these really deep, you know, observations back in time. I, I could have picked an immense number of things. Uh, the comet impact, uh, uh, Shoemaker Levy 9 on uh, Jupiter. Uh, the, the, the list is long. I'm not uh, in discussing where I'm just going to pick some things on stellar evolution. So uh, let's skip on. So this is a repetition of Gordon's slide, uh, just to give him a, another little tip of the heart, because uh, if I could do these images, I'd be really, really pleased, uh, and I can't. So therefore, uh, well done, Gordon. Um, so uh, two parts at the bottom, planetary nebula and supernova, and we'll cover both of those. Um, little bit of fun for me uh, in the lives of stars. Uh, on the right-hand image is the, is the hourglass planetary nebula, and on the left is uh, my old uh, undergraduate professor, John Porter, who sadly died very young in 2005. Uh, the image on the right was a poster I had to make uh, for a talk on uh, the structure of stars and evolution uh, back in the day. And uh, I always remember John was uh, who, who could just kick my ass at maths. Um, but he always used to let us start uh, a talk saying, you know, we're doing physics, but remember that's always pretty pictures. So when I, when, when I kind of had the chance to do this one and show the picture of planetary nebula and I could pick the same picture of a planetary nebula that I did back in 2005, I thought it would be really churlish not to just give a little tip of the heart to Dr. Porter, uh, who is a, a really exceptional lecturer and was a lost his all the time. So, uh, skipping on, uh, uh, we could talk about lots of uh, things in stellar nurseries, um, Orion Nebula, lots of Horsa Nebula, other things. Uh, just to not be slightly conventional, I, I've picked a different image. Most of these things come from the ESA Hubble webpage. In this case, it's uh, NAT3B, which has another name, as I'll get to in a second. And the point of this image is to show the fact that uh, big young stars uh, have a large blast that causes uh, a wind to take place and move the gas cloud around them. So this is a particular area where Hubble's work has been widely acknowledged as linking star formation with stellar evolution. And in this case, we're relying on the infrared instruments, uh, the Wide Field Camera 3 and NICMOS. And these are capable of looking through the, through the dust clouds to the newly born stars. So some of the most surprising discoveries so far come by peering through the clouds of dust surrounding the center of the Milky Way. Astronomers find that the center, which at one point in time was thought to be calm and almost dead, uh, is in fact populated with massive instant star, infant stars gathered into clusters. Uh, the extremely intense radiation from the newly born ultra bright uh, stars, uh, in this case, as you can see on the left hand side of the image, has blown a glowing spherical bubble in the nebula NT3b, also referred to as NGC 1748. Uh, the space telescope image uh, helped to decipher the complex interplay of the gas and the radiation star forming region and what's a nearby galaxy. Uh, so what you can really see from this image is, uh, if I pop in here, star in the centre, uh, and uh, this image shows just how these massive stars sculpt the environment. Uh, so you know, it, I know we know from our sun that the, the, there's the, the solar wind and it clears the, the area, but you're looking at the same effect you know, in a, in, a, in a distant galaxy for a much uh, younger, much hotter star. Uh, and these processes uh, can also be seen in the Milky Way in regions like the Orion Nebula. Uh, the Hubble telescope is famous for its contribution to our knowledge of its star formation in very distant galaxies. Although most of the stars in the universe were born several billion years ago, when the universe was young, we do, and uh, star formation, as we said, is uh, reduced, it does continue today. Uh, and in this region, in this image, you can see Hubble 
showing a very compact star forming region in a small part of the large Magellanic Clyde, uh, which uh, according to the information you can clearly see reading in front of me, is the only 165,000 light years away from the Milky Way and seen uh, from the naked eye in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, although not by me, uh, uh, perhaps one day. Uh, next stage of stellar evolution, so that's the birth, uh, we're going to skip the whole life and go to when they die. Uh, and we're going to consider stellar skeletons, could pick up uh, planetary nebula. In this case, uh, going to look instead, going to talk for a minute or two instead of the white dwarf stars and what we can see in the globular clusters. So uh, the last phase of solar-like stars uh, have been investigated by Hubble through observations of planetary nebula and protoplanetary nebula. And those are the nice colorful shells of gas expelled into space. But you also get white dwarfs. So these are stellar uh, remnants and provide a fossil re record of the progenitor stars, which shone so brightly they exhausted the nuclear fuel. Uh, through the measurements, it's possible to determine the age of those stars. And this is very common with globular clusters where you're, you're finding them to be very old. Uh, and therefore, the globular clusters become an important cosmological tool. So to give the definition, you can see the credit in the bottom side here, the NASA uh, H. Richard British uh, University of Columbia. Uh, so they, refer, they describe this image as looking like glittering jewels. Uh, and the uh, HST in this uh, has shown the, the globular star cluster in the, uh, NGC 1697. Uh, so it's scattered all amongst uh, that, those brilliant stars are very faint ones. And in this case, uh, it was Hubble's advanced camera for surveys, uh, took a census effectively of the stars in the globular cluster. Uh, and there's a quick definition, the globular cluster is referred to as such because it looks like a spherical concentration of old stars. Uh, the advanced camera then looked for the faintest red dwarf stars, and these are 26 magnitude, uh, much cooler and much lower than the, in mass than our sun. And uh, the dimmest white dwarfs are 28 uh, magnitude. Uh, and these are the burnt out re relics of normal stars. Uh, the light from uh, the dimmest white dwarf is about equal to a birthday candle as seen from the moon uh, on Earth. So uh, switching to over here, the image in the lower right hand side, uh, you can see the little red dot within the circle. Uh, that's uh, a very faint red dwarf star that's been picked up. Uh, in that image by Hubble. Uh, and in the upper right, you can see a dim uh, white dwarf uh, that's a little blue image, uh, uh, little image in the blue circle. And it's so cool that instead of looking red, it has undergone a chemical change in its atmosphere that makes it appear blue. So that's what this plot in the right hand side is trying to do is show that uh, you've got the main sequence stars where they, they progressively uh, go through the life and appear to go redder. And in the case of white dwarf stars, as the, once, the, once the white dwarf star is formed, as it ages, it goes slightly redder as well. But at some point, uh, a transition it was predicted to take place uh, uh, that would then mean that the white dwarf star went, even though it was not as bright as before, it would become bluer. Uh, this was theoretically predicted, but unobserved. And lo and behold, uh, Hubble saw it. So uh, you were able to link the uh, stellar processes that were predicted to be going on in the atmospheres of white dwarf stars with uh, observations from the, the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, so uh, uh, speaking as a former nuclear structure physicist, uh, who did some, the occasional astrophysics measurements, uh, that's really cool. And I, and I would use word ex, other words except we're on Facebook. So uh, jumping beyond that to the more exciting end of life of stars uh, are, are supernova. So uh, I'm not going to talk much about this one. I've got a different one to talk about, uh, probably one that you'll you know, be ultimately familiar with. Uh, but in this case, so you've got an example here of UGC uh, 12158, barred spiral galaxy in the Hubble sequence. And the thing in the bottom left is a supernova that was seen by uh, two British astronomers in 2004, and it's 400 uh, million light years away. So uh, a fantastic amount of energy being produced. But that's not what I want to talk about. And I do have one more video 
Uh, if the sound is really bad, I'll skip it. Uh, John, if you could let me know if it has failed, then I'll move on, but I will give it a go. Or there might not be any sound. Ah, this one's okay. So, so this is just scrolling through a sequence of images to look for a supernova in 1987-8. Uh, and what we'll ultimately get zoomed into and you just start to see it form is the supernova in the center and those cracking two rings above and below and the one around the outside, uh, which is going to be the top or the next point. So this is an image taken from 2017 in February. Uh, in, the, in the center, you can see 1987A, and you can see this glowing ring on the outside. And that's what I want to talk about in these images. So in this case, uh, where this is the, so obviously, sadly, in a, in a way, the supernova went off before Hubble went up. But because Hubble's been up for so long, we've been able to look at it uh, multiple times over the years and build up a picture and that ring of gas that came off was before the supernova went off and is moving much slower so after the supernova took place another shell of material uh, started expanding and is expanding at a faster rate than this older shell of material and at some point that's going to hit it and then you get to see an increase in temperature and density that causes another bunch of reactions that allow you to see light. So that's what's been visible in this image. And all of that is the principles behind which people are looking at to see if they can understand the processes going on in supernova explosions, for to understand the shells and material and what elements are kicked off and what sequence and what light peaks are produced. So uh, this is a little video just showing a uh, sequence since 1994. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, spectacularly impressed with this. Uh, it's, it, you know, observations of, of a supernova uh, and then able to correlate it with physical processes uh, based on our models. It's, it's, it's really impressive. Uh, beyond uh, Hubble, um, you then have Chandra and you have the millimeter array at Alma. And again, this is the complementarity of the space-based measurements and the ground measurements where you can produce composite images. So in this case, Hubble studies have revealed that the dense ring of gas around the supernova is going in optical light. Uh, that This diameter is about a light year. Uh, and the ring was there, uh, the estimates are about tw at least 20,000 years before the star exploded. Uh, a flash of ultraviolet light from the explosion energized the gas in the ring, making it glow for decades. The central structure uh, visible inside the ring has now grown to about half a light year across. So this is dated from uh, 2017. And uh, most noticeable are blobs of debris around the center uh, racing away from each other and they're going at a speed of about 20 million miles per hour. So from 1999, uh, we're now talking about the Chandra measurements here, um, uh, until 2013, Chandra showed the data showed an expanding ring of X-ray emission that had been getting steadily brighter and the blast wave from the original explosion had been bursting through and heating the, the ring of gas surrounding the supernova, pro producing the secondary X-ray emission. In the past few years, this has stopped getting brighter uh, and from fe about February 2013 until 2015, the total amount of X-ray energy remained constant. Uh, in the bottom left-hand side, looking at the millimeter wave picture, um, uh, ALMA was used to observe the glowing remains, studying how it's forging vast amounts of new dust. Uh, so all that energy is brightening dust that was surrounding the supernova uh, thereafter. And this will be the building blocks, much like we are. I, I know there's many talks on that we are uh, formed in uh, stellar furnaces. So this is the process that takes place. Uh, these observations also suggest that dust in the early universe likely formed from supernova explosions. Um, astronomers are still looking for evidence of a black hole or a neutron star left behind the blast. Uh, they, observe, they did observe a flashing neutrinos from the star just as it erupted. 
Uh, and this detection makes astronomers quite certain that a compact object did form at the center of a star, uh, either a neutron star or a black hole, but no telescope has uh, seen any evidence for that yet. So last two slides. Um, uh, science powerhouse to come back to the science topic. Uh, so the, the H index uh, of Hubble uh, defined as the maximum value of H such that the author has published H papers. So in 2016, Hubble had an H index of 257. That's at least 257 papers cited at least 257 times. Um, for comparison, the University of Oxford has a, a, an H index of 146. There are a few super duper individuals that have high H indexes. Andrew Z Zisserman is a, com a computer scientist who's got one. Uh, I think the top person uh, today is Ronald Kessler. He has 295. And just to get a COVID reference in, Tony Fauci has an H index of 221. So Hubble is better than Tony Fauci. Go figure. Um, so uh, all I can really say, uh, I hope this hasn't been too long. I'm sorry for the videos being banned, but hooray for Hubble and uh, roll on the James Webb. Am I still there? Gordon, you're on mute. Uh, so, somebody had to do it. <laughs> okay. Th thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm not sure if there was an, an awful lot of uh, questions coming in. Uh, now... I think I think there was a there was a couple that we can maybe catch at the end, uh, but I suspect uh, some of the things have uh, been captured already. Anyway, uh, I've got a few Hubble images just to finish off, and of course I have to tell you the link to Voldemort for those of you that have been sitting on the edge of your seat waiting for the answer uh, to this bit of trivia. So let me just share uh, my screen. Okay, so just to finish off with a few uh, Hubble images that Caithness Astronomy Group members identified as their, their favourites. Uh, so here's one of the Carina Nebula. Uh, now, to me, this just looks like a fantastic piece of art, uh, as do most of uh, the, uh, the Nebula images obtained by Hubble. And... Here's ones that have been covered before. And uh, this is images from the Eagle Nebula and the so-called Pillars of Creation on the left-hand side, uh, where new stars are being formed from the gas and dust clouds. Now, the interesting thing for amateur uh, astrophotographers, it is possible to image the Pillars of creation uh, in the Eagle Nebula with relatively basic equipment. Uh, so I have managed it myself. It's quite low down from Keith Ness. So uh, it can be a bit of a challenge uh, because it's it's not much above the southern horizon as the, the darker nights appear uh, after summertime. And here we've got a uh, number of other eye-catching images. Uh, I know the cat's eye nebula at the bottom is, uh, is a favourite of many. Uh, so it's a planetary nebula. And we're going to finish off with a selection of planetary nebula and supernova remnants uh, there. And what, what always amazes me is how, how different they all look. So each, uh, although during uh, their stellar lifetimes, uh, a lot of the stars uh, follow a, a kind of set pattern uh, or several set patterns. So they are quite similar to others. Uh, when it comes to the end of their, uh, their life, uh, they, they do seem to generate something that is uh, less uh, common and very much more unique. 
and uh, they, they definitely look, look like bits of art to me. So what's the, uh, the connection? Well, it, it turns out that Voldemort's mother is named Merope Gaunt. And for those of you that are Harry Potter fans, uh, just a bit of trivia to finish, uh, you'll, you'll probably realise that there's a number of the characters in the Harry Potter stories that have links to uh, astronomical uh, uh, objects. So uh, you, you, you've got Draco Malfoy in the, the top of a already covered Voldemort. Uh, you've got Bellatrix Lestrange, named after a star in Orion, Sirius Black, uh, so Sirius being the bright star in the night sky, and Sirius has got a brother called Regulus Arcturus Black, uh, so his uh, first and middle names are bright stars in the sky as well. And there are, are a few other examples, uh, but those are probably the standout ones. So I hope you liked that bit of trivia to finish. Uh, Ian has already mentioned about the James Webb telescope, which will be launched later this year. And it's hoped that it will continue on uh, the, the good work that Hubble, well, not good work, the outstanding work that Hubble has done over the last 30 or so years, advancing our understanding of the universe. So I hope you enjoyed uh, the presentations tonight. It, it did take a little bit longer than we anticipated, uh, but uh, that's kind of what happens when uh, you, uh, you, you've got a topic to talk about that could easily cover several uh, events worth of uh, presentations and you try to cram all in the one. Uh, but I hope you did enjoy it. And if there are any final questions, I'm we, sure we that you question. Ian and Neil would be happy to answer them. Uh, well, I, I, it's a question for you from uh, sure. uh, uh, our esteemed David Orr. Is, uh, how much longer will the HST remain in oper operational, especially with the James Webb telescope and other larger Earth-based telescopes coming online soon? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, uh, Gordon, to I can help. We'll end up having to Google it, but it sounds like Neil might have a, yeah, a, an idea for us. Yeah, uh, the two two answers really. Someone had asked earlier about the number of gyros that the uh, the Hubble Space Telescope had. It started off with six, three of which remain operational, and that's the minimum requirement to uh, allow it to have the the good pointing stability. Uh, NASA are saying now that they expect the Hubble Space Telescope to go on operation, continue operation until 2025. Okay, well that sounds like there's plenty more science and lovely pictures uh, for us all to enjoy, uh, which is fantastic news. And, and it maybe means that if uh, the James Webb Telescope, which is primarily looking at the infrared range, finds something really interesting, uh, maybe the Hubble Telescope can point at it as well, and uh, we can elaborate on the, uh, the detail uh, that can be obtained. Uh, is there is there any other questions that we haven't managed to cover uh, that either John or Ian you've managed to spot? No more that I've seen, John. Do you see any others? No, there's nothing. Nothing more come through uh, Facebook, and I think we've answered all the ones uh, elsewhere. Oh, those. Uh, sorry, somebody did ask. Dwayne was he also known as Digger? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, that was... Certainly that's how he's been introduced at past Case Night Science Festivals when he's appeared at them, so uh, yeah, yeah, I believe so. That was uh, Cyber House that uh, asked that question. Okay, right. So if, if that's the questions for uh, tonight, uh, I'm delighted that we managed to get through it without too many hiccups other than the sound going a bit wobbly uh, at one point in a video and uh, at another point when uh, my, right. I, thought, I was getting worried my voice was going to give in. Uh, so uh, th thankfully everything uh, uh, managed to, to work uh, sufficiently well, I think. Uh, so th thank you all for, for joining us. 
uh, tonight. I'm hoping that you'll all now go and have a look at the Science Festival uh, website uh, because there are some fantastic events coming up during March. Uh, some of them by uh, KTS Astronomy Group, and uh, but there are many other uh, interesting events. Uh, I've I've already got my my virtual ticket booked for about eight different ones, so uh, I'm I'm sure there'll be something there for everyone. So I'd encourage you to to have a look uh, at that website. Uh, so I think at this point we'll we'll probably stop the. Uh, uh, the Facebook streaming chats and give the opportunity if there's any Caithness Astronomy Group members